Hi, this is Jim Gibson with CableSupply.com and we're down here in San Diego, California today and we're going to be looking at one of our installs. Uh, it's a small suite, they're just doing some tenant improvements. There's no uh, furniture in the way of any of the install and on top of that we're going to look to see what some of the technicians are doing and how they're installing the cable. As you can see with the, um, uh, with the push pole, uh, the, the advantages of saving time going up and down a ladder. So as you can see, you can extend it out and you don't always have to make it click. There is little detents in there that can hold it stiff. It doesn't really have to hold it stiff, but it goes further and further and further. And as you can see, come on in here. So we pop the ceiling tile halfway. So you can see it's right there. It's going all the way over to here. So the technician now is going to grab it and he's going to collapse it. And right behind you, you could see it there for a second. There it is. Now he's going to pull it and collapse it. Now remember, this ceiling tile doesn't have to be open. This is open just for the video. So he's pulling all the cables with a pull string. So if he needs to pull more cables in the future, he has the ability to do that. So think of all the time that's been saved now. He's went 20, 20 foot or more. He can actually go further with that, I believe. I have to check the footage. But this one's open so you could view the cable as it goes by. So all that time now has been saved. Now there's an obstruction in the ceiling here. It's a makeshift firewall. It's not really a serious firewall. And what has happened is, is this used to be a different suite here. The firewall would have went all the way down to the floor, but this is not according to code, this firewall. Um, but at any rate, sometimes they just leave them up in the ceiling when they put the two suites together. So you're going to run into them. And uh, that's no longer a firewall. That's no longer going to protect anything at this rate. So, uh, you know, we can go through it at any distance. But firewalls, if you're going to breach a firewall, there are certain code issues when you breach them, and uh, you have to breach them a certain way. You can't leave big holes in them. And if I'm right, I don't know if the camera can get it, but over here you can see a big hole in the firewall. That is obviously not a firewall or remnants of an old one. One other thing you do, too, is when you pull cable, you do things like this every so many feet, and this is a service loop. And so when I pull on this, you're going to see the cable over there come up. If I can get it to come up, and I don't want to don't want to damage the tile here. But that's what you would do, and then you pull the cable this way a little bit, and then the other person pulls the cable a little more, and so you're doing a service loop. So every so many feet, you want that service loop in there until you get the cable all the way to where you want it to go, and then of course you pull either back the excess or you pull the the uh, extra cable all the way down. That's the whole idea of a service loop, where one technician pulls on it. See up here is a firewall, and you can see it. There's fire caulk there. To, to, uh, so if there's a fire in one suite, there's not going to be, uh, it's, it's going to have a hard time getting to the other side. But if you look down here, follow me down to here, you see we have metal boxes on this. That's because this is a firewall. You've got to have metal boxes on this. And um, this is a low voltage metal box. Uh, it's used for the low voltage side. Notice it's close to it's it's close to the 110 block. And right here is your beam, so the, it's being separated. You always want to pull the, your cable down in, uh, into a different uh, area uh, than the 110. So the 110 is going up this way. The cable, the other cable is going up this way, and you have a, uh, a metal uh, wall going right here. Uh, but again, this is what you want, and it's going to have conduit going all the way up to the top. Fairly easy to uh, shoot a cable down there, and, uh, but you want that on a firewall. You don't need that anywhere else. So just go look at another jack over here where it is not a firewall, and you'll see the difference between the two jacks. Let's take a look. Or the, the two brackets. Now, this is a low voltage. Uh, bracket that's not a firewall, so it's open in the back, and you have insulation there and all. That's where 
keeping things quiet, not actually warm or cold or anything, but keeping quiet between the two rooms. And the electrician was nice enough to put a pull string there. If he didn't put a pull string, there'd be no problem. Use your fishing rods. It goes right through that insulation. It only takes a second more. I really like this idea of nice and neat here. The electrician did a really nice job. And uh, you always, of course, it's always nice to have um, your, your voice and data outlets right next to your jack, because obviously, when you plug in your computer, you're going to have to plug in the power also. It's nice to have it next to each other. Um, in my opinion, uh, you should, right now when the suite is, is empty like it is, you can look around here, this is the time to do the cabling. This is the most convenient time to do the cabling. And in reality, just to add a couple extra jacks, this is the time to do it before furniture is in, before people are moving in. Um, and all we want to do today um, is we just want to pull cable. Uh, don't want to jack. In some cases, it'll look like we already have. But we just want to pull cable because when they come in and do the painting, when they come in and do the carpet, that can mess up your jacks. So this is pre-cable today. And then we're going to set finish um, later on, either tomorrow or later on today. And set and finish is when you put the faceplate on and the jacks. That's set and finish. And then you punch it down in the back. So uh, the first phase of cabling is pre-cable. And that's what they're doing now over here. They're pulling the cable, and they're going to pull it down each of those jacks that are open, those low voltage jacks that are on a firewall that have metal uh, brackets in the back. And uh, that's called pre-cable. So once all the cables pulled and the ceiling tiles are back up and everything else, <coughs> once they do all that, then it's, uh, that's the end of your pre-cable. Then your next step is uh, set finish. And then the last step is the test and label. And that's what they'll be doing later. Take a look down here, and what you're going to see is the pull boxes. Now, notice that we have all the boxes together, and then they're going out and spread out through the suite. Now, that's the way you're supposed to do it. Um, is it technically wrong to do it another way? No, it's not technically wrong, but this is the best way to do it when you're pulling cables. So this is best practice, is to put all the boxes in, in one area and pull from where the backboard's going to be. So, and if you notice on these cables, we have blue and white. Now, that's just our custom. Uh, generally speaking, blue is the most popular color out there, and white is, uh, the, is the second most popular. We use the blue and white because it's easier for us to distinguish between voice and data. Now, both of them are Cat5e uh, uh, CMR, so it's not a problem. It's just a different color, and it makes it easier for us. We're pulling one cable. Uh, one blue and one white cable to each location because that's what the customer has requested. One voice and one data. Now at this point it looks like the customer is going to have a digital phone system rather than a, a voice over IP system. With voice over IP it wouldn't matter. Um, uh, we wouldn't need to separate the voice from the data cables because they're all going to go to a backboard. I'm sorry, they're all going to go to a patch panel and uh, labeled individual jacks and it, it wouldn't matter what you plugged in there either a voice or data uh, because it uh, separates in, in programming uh, and so and of course a VoIP telephone is nothing more than a small computer in, in reality um, but in this case the customer is asked for uh, digital phones which is absolutely fine uh, digital phones are at the peak of their technology uh, there's, there's a ton of features that they have. Uh, it's a great system, um, and uh, it's, it's relatively inexpensive, um, and they're reliable. So uh, the difference between VoIP and data, that's for another video. But today we're doing it uh, for a digital uh, telephone system and voicemail system, and then uh, the other cable is going to be for the data. Um, come on in here. I'm going to show you some things here that you should have. Okay. And as you can see, the cable's going up, and this is where we're pulling from. So we're pulling from here. And in reality, if you want an easier pull, if we're pulling really far, this is where you would put your, uh, your uh, pulley. Little pulleys from Jameson, uh, second man uh, pulley, really makes it a lot easier to pull. They've decided not to do it because all the runs are relatively short. Now what we have back here is a piece of wood, and this is called the backboard. And this is where we're going to place the 66 blocks. This is where we're going to place the patch panels. 
Um, but it's also a place where you can put your routers and switch and uh, the other data equipment. If, is, is there other data equipment out there? Between, be, I guess there is firewalls. Uh, routers, switches, um, a telephone system is going to go on here. Now, there's a little bit of management that needs to be done here on the backboard uh, because we've walked into backboards where someone has taken their equipment and put it dead center, right in the middle. And we don't have enough room anywhere to put a phone system. We don't have enough room anywhere to put your switch or your, your uh, patch panel. So you got to be courteous for the person that comes behind you. Uh, keep it to the side if you can. Keep it close to the side and therefore it, it gives extra room somewhere else on the uh, uh, backboard for another piece of equipment that's going on. Or if you're doing everything on a backboard, then manage it. Just don't throw it up there. Remember, neatness counts in voice and data cabling because when it comes time to troubleshoot, if it's not neat, you're, you're going to have a nightmare and you're going to have problems. So keep everything neat as possible um, on the, on the uh, backboard. Uh, usually these backboards are 5 8 uh, inch backboards from, uh, you know, you can get them at Home Depot, things like that. It's one product we do not sell on our website is backboards because you can get them at Home Depot. Now, there's some state laws, some states, not all, I should say very few, that require the backboard to be a fire-rated backboard. Don't know why. It's really not that important. It's just a piece of wood. It's not very big here. And uh, in this case, it's just put right up against um, uh, plywood. I mean, right up against um, uh, a board, plasterboard. So in this case, it's put right up against plasterboard. And uh, if you notice, uh, they, they put them in such a way, uh, the connection, that it's going right into the studs. Now, remember, if this was, if, if this was not just um, particle board, and it's not, it's just cement. So let's start that over again, okay? So you notice that this 5 uh, 8 inch um, a board, and you can put thicker boards there. I wouldn't put any smaller, and I'll tell you the reason why. Um, this right here is cement. It looks like particle board, but it's cement. So what they've done is they've anchored it using probably a halty gun. You know, that's where they push it in and it has a little 22 round uh, uh, rifle round in it, blank, not, not real round, but a blank. And at the end of that thing, you, you put your nail um, that's used for, uh, for uh, a cement. So you put, you, you put it in there and you fire it and it, it tightens it right up. So they have attached it well, and they have attached it on the edges, which is nice. Not necessary, but it is nice. And they've put in more than just one or two. So in this case, it has six, seven, seven of them in here. And that's nice. That's nice and strong and everything else. Now, the reason why you need a thick backboard, especially on the, on the cement, is when you start using drywall screws to attach your 66 block, and other uh, things in there, and that's what you should use, drywall screws, because they really grip quick and it's easy. You can use them on your, uh, your drill. But the reason why you want that thick is if your drywall, saw, uh, drywall screws um, are large, what's going to happen is it's going to go through the wood, it's going to hit the cement. It will not uh, puncture or go through the cement, but it will pull the backboard away from the cement. So you'll start to bulge and pretty soon get enough of those screws in here it's going to pop these, these nails out. It's going to take them right out of the cement. So you want to use short screws, thick backboard, when you're going up against a cement backing in the back of the backboard. But this backboard gives us something that we can mount equipment to. It's really hard to mount all the, the equipment and all the screws you got to put in these things just to cement or even to uh, uh, drywall. Uh, sometimes I've seen people mount things to drywall and someone hits it real hard and it pulls right out. Okay, so you always should use a backboard that's attached to cement or a backboard when it's on drywall, it should be on the, uh, on the beams, on the uh, 2x4s or the metal 2x4s um, uh, to hold it in place. So again, short screws, thick backboard when it comes to, uh, when it comes to um, cement. Now, you can have longer screws if you want if this was drywall because it'll go right through drywall but you want small screws, thick backboard. And this is really nice also. The, uh, here, I'll, I'll switch over here. Uh, the electrician has given us a nice outlet, and this is nice. This is fine, this is great. Um, 
And we could probably uh, grab the ground off of this also, even though I personally like independent grounds. This would work fine. This is nice. It's nice of him to put it way in the corner. That's where you want it. You want it in the corner. And uh, so as soon as they're done here, what they're going to do is when, they're pull, when they pull the cable, they're going to pull a little excess. And they're going to put a service loop in it like this and put that up there. And the reason why you want to put a service loop up there is because every once in a while, you put your patch panel in there and you punch it down in your 66 block. And it looks nice and neat, but up there you got a service loop. So a nice little turn up there connected to maybe a beam, a cross beam or a rafter. Because what happens is if something happens in the future, which may be tomorrow, um, and you have to move those uh, 66 blocks and those patch panels, this gives you that flexibility to move them. So always put a little bit of a service loop up there, you know, one or two loops at the most. Sometimes I've seen people that have put like 50 foot up there. It's like massive amounts of cable. Not a good idea. Just like that, that's enough. And remember, when you're doing tie wraps on these things, you don't cinch them down as tight as you can because it does affect the cable and its ability to transmit data. It doesn't affect voice that much, but it does affect the other thing. So this is a nice, nice little closet. This is a small install anyway. One thing I like about this, a little bit of a ventilation here. They're going to put some vents here. It's nice about that because it gives it some air. It really doesn't get that hot in there, to be honest with you. And since it's surrounded by air-conditioned walls and things like that, it's going to keep cool. You don't need an air conditioner in something that small. Uh, uh, you just need air circulation through so it doesn't get really hot and humid and things like that. So the cable going up there comes over to here. And remember, we talked about a service loop. In this loop, what you do is you pull the cable. As you can see, it's moving over there. See? And then once you get that loop here, then someone else further down the line also pulls. And it gives you a little bit of, every so many feet, it gives you a little bit of uh, cable management. helps you pull. When you're all done, though, this, this loop goes away. You don't push this up into the ceiling. It would be a mess. Do you need to get into something? Do whatever, you're, it's all yours. Do you mind if we videotape while you do it? And I know when you're looking at it, if you're a novice when it comes to cable, and it looks like you're wasting cable. He's pulling out this excess cable here. And he's just gonna cut it off. And it's like, why do you need so much cable? Well, you know the most expensive cable on earth is the one that's one inch too short. And so we always do this um, and uh, cut off excess. And you can see the excess on the ground there. So if you sit there and you take this and you take this out, some of this is going to be turned into that service loop that's up in the ceiling. The rest is going to be used to uh, 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 nicely dress the cable in. So, of course, we're going to cut off probably about five foot of that um, and uh, we're going to recycle it. I also notice the fact that each of the uh, technicians have their tools right on their belt. It, when, you're, when you're cutting and you're doing work and everything else, you want to use those tools. Uh, you want them right there at your hand and use a lot of these electrical tapes to tie cables together. This is not unusual. Notice that the cable is is staggered um, and you want to do that so it doesn't catch on anything and it gives you a, a, a smaller uh, access there so you only even though it's three cables there it's only one cable thick at the beginning and pulling three is no big deal but when you start pulling five or more cables ten cables you, you need to do it that way you know, I want to show you the floor plan there so it's clearly marked voice data where the different locations are and of course I want to keep the confidentiality of the customer so I'm covering up certain areas there who they are um, customers deserve deserve your confidentiality so never talk about one company to another and what an, one company is doing if they're your customer they deserve you not to reveal any secrets about their expansion or their, uh, what they're doing. But this is a nice little floor plan here. 
uh, where it gives you all the, the details of everything, phone numbers and all, and I can't show you too much of that. Um, but remember, customers deserve that, 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 you know, maybe they're not too concerned about it, but you should be as an installer. So don't talk about one company to another company. It is inappropriate and it's unprofessional. And you never want to talk about expansions, things like that, where they're growing, where they're opening offices and all, because that sometimes is considered confidential information. And if the company wants to announce it, they can announce it. Uh, but you should not be the one describing how many phones they have, how many data pools, where they're opening, how they do business, what type of servers they have, what type of software they're running. Uh, even though you may think it's some cool ideas that they're doing, that's just between you and that company. It should never be shared with another company. Okay, here's some uh, pull string, inexpensive stuff that comes in like boxes of 5,000 foot and all. And we always do pull strings, and the reason why is if you notice, we have five or six boxes in the other room there, and uh, so we're pulling five or six cables. The issue is, though, with that is what happens if when I'm done with these five or six cables and I have five or six more cables there and five or six more cables uh, over there? Well, the issue at that point is uh, if, if I'm not using pull string, then I have to fish again all the way through the ceiling. And, and you know something, every time you're up in that ceiling, you could possibly cause damage to the ceiling tiles. Uh, another thing you want to be careful of is sometimes your hands really gets dirty, especially in an older building, and you start putting back ceiling tiles, and all of a sudden you got fingerprints all over the place. So keep your hands clean when it's time to put the ceiling tiles back. If you're in a dirty building, wash your hands often because it doesn't look good when you're leaning up against the wall, when you're on top of a ladder. Everybody knows it's you because it's the only one that can reach that high because you're on top of a ladder. So keep your hands clean. Now the other thing we use, and I don't think we're using it too much here because we have uh, the electrician actually provided pull strings, but uh, these fishing rods, and we talked about them before. And uh, all you need to do on these is you just go in and you go right up, you attach your cable and you pull it down. Remember, it's cable pulling, not cable pushing. So you don't go up and push it down you know, attach the cable to the front and then try to push it down through the insulation. It won't work. If it does, it's going to take you twice as long. So what you want to do is you want to push up, not down. Uh, another thing, I think I've talked about this on other videos, is that you notice we're not numbering any of these cables here. We don't need to. We can identify them later. And this whole idea that somehow you had to have one, uh, jack one over there and jack two here and then three and then four and go completely around the room in order, is this not professional? And I'll tell you the reason why. It takes twice as long to do that because you've got to figure it out at the other end. Which cable is one? What did I write on the cable? Where did I write? Don't need to do that. All you need to do is uh, just pull the cable, punch it all down nice and neat, and then identify the cable based on where it appears, either on the 66 block or on a patch panel. So this might be patch panel A, port 5. Over here might be patch panel uh, A, port 10. So it doesn't matter because the person looks at the label and it says A10. They know they can go right back and do A10. So usually what happens is if when you're inexperienced you do this thing in a circle where you keep track of the cables and you're going to waste time. It's, it's just a waste of time. Don't do it. Um, and sometimes customers request that. The problem is what happens if between cable one and, number, and cable two, uh, six months from now, they want another cable there. And so now you have what? It's out of order. It doesn't work. So just pull the cable, punch it down, identify it. We use little LED identifiers. It identifies it just like this. You label both ends. You test everything completely. And then you're out of the suite, and it's done professional. And that's how it's done. It's done professionally like that. So do it that way. Don't do it uh, silly-wise and try to keep everything in order. That's not, it, I mean, you can do it, but it's going to take twice as long and it's useless once you pull the next cable uh, three or four months down the road. So in this case, all he's doing is just pushing it right through the flex. Doesn't even have to use a, uh, a tape, fish tape. Just pushes it right through the flex and once in a while it gets caught right on that edge really pain. Sometimes you have to stick your finger up like Rick's doing there to inside and 
and see if you can wiggle it around a little bit. Most of the times, this goes real fast. This goes real fast. But there's a special kind of a fish rod that's used for that that's very, very flexible. It's better than the fishing rods, the fiberglass fishing rods uh, that we use. It's a plastic rod, and it goes right up and right down. Now, remember, you don't see any boxes out here. There's no cable boxes out here. All the cable boxes are back in the phone room. That's where they belong. So you pull from the phone room out here. You don't pull from out here to the phone room. That's not the way it's done. Always pull from the phone room to the jacks. And remember, you're pulling cable, not pushing cable. So you don't want to push cable with any of your tools, like with, uh, where is it? Or push pull. In fact, let's talk about the push pull. This one's kind of beat up. It's really old. And these things are like, you know, even though the end is broken off, it's still usable. So as you pull it out, pull it out right here, you can see it. You can get it to snap if you want. Most of the times, if you pull it out real hard like that, it snaps. Or if it doesn't snap, it just stays put. So you don't even have to snap it. But if you see how far I can go, look at that. So, you know, it goes quite a distance across that ceiling. Now, the, before these things were out, you had to take every other ceiling tile out and fish it over and fish it over. Or what you did is you used one of these fishing rods uh, to do it. And, you know, they're just so flexible, they really can't get that far. You see how it's bending? You can't kind of like get it to stay up. Now you can use it. Don't get me wrong. It will work, but it's a pain because it bends so easily, uh, which is great when you're going up through insulation and you want to come out the top. Uh, or you're going from the top down through insulation and then you pull the cable through after you grab the cable. But this, look at this. This doesn't bend. So I can go right over, as I'm up in the ceiling like this, you see, I can go right over all the, uh, the stuff that's up in the ceiling, the, the air vents, uh, the, uh, the different cables and all, and I can push it right over top. Now when I get to the other end, I'll show you what happens at the other end. So let's say I'm up in the ceiling here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to collapse it. And remember, I don't have a lot of room up in the ceiling, so I can't really pull it out. And I don't want to cause that stress on the T-bar by yanking it down. So all I do is just collapse it. And as I collapse it, the cable at the other end is being pulled towards me. So if you're a professional cabler, you know, this will pay for itself. So I'm up in the ceiling, it collapses, I can pull it down. Or if I had to go further yet, I don't have to collapse it at all, I just keep on pushing it further yet. And of course the cable attaches right to the end. Uh, on some of ours, we've actually broke off this, this end, and it does, you know, everything breaks. Especially the way we treat this stuff. You put your cable here, you use tape, tape it around, you still use it. It's, the shell itself is almost indestructible. Uh, that's what's so nice about it. But it is a tool. If you're a professional, you get the right tools. It's going to save you the time. Even on the first job, it will start paying you back if you have the right tools. Plus, you'll look more professional. Your job will go quicker, easier. You won't be staying on an eight-hour job. You won't be there for 16 hours doing the work. So if you save an hour in every job, let's say you save two hours in every job, how long is it going to be until you can afford to pay one of these off and then it pays for years? later it pays it's it pays for itself the same thing with the uh, the fishing poles that I showed you they're great going up and down ceilings but remember you don't push cables up you don't push cables down you always attach the cable to the end and pull it through I really like this electrician though who's given us not only a P ring these are called P rings P for plastic ring or plaster ring um, but at the same time, he's also given us a really nice pull string. Just, we're going to go up here, we're going to attach some cables, and we're going to pull it through. Now, one other thing, if you notice, too, that when we pull cable, we start, 
not only at the computer room, but we pull the longest cable first, and then we do the short ones last. And the reason why is if you pull to the longest to the furthest end where you're supposed to be and you're using your pull string, your next pull you don't have to pull so far, and the next pull you don't have to pull so far. So it's less and less and less and you're spreading them out as in the ceiling, going to the jacks that you need. So your path, figure out your path, figure out your path to the furthest jack from, uh, from your patch panel or your 66 blocks, and then pull to that one first, and then pull the shorter ones after that. So this is going to be one of the last jacks that we're going to pull to because it's so close to the phone room that we're actually going to uh, pull this last. And the pull strings are out there in the ceiling, so it's easy, remember, because it was pulled all the way to the other end. So we just grab the pull string right here. This is a low ceiling. And then we can pull the cable right to here, drop it right down into that area there. Some practical things. If you notice our ladders, we don't use cheap ladders. Someone gets hurt on, an ex an, uh, on a cheap ladder, uh, workers comp uh, charges, things like that. So we buy top of the line ladders. We clearly mark them with our company because if we're in here with other trades, um, the other trades have the same manufacturer they're going to uh, confuse their ladder with our ladder and our equipment. So you've got to clearly mark all your equipment. In this case, uh, these ladders are top of the line. Now there's one other thing about it too, is these are fiberglass. And so um, the aluminum ladders, if you run up on aluminum, of course this has aluminum rungs, but this is insulated. So you stand less chance that if you hit a live wire that, you know, and again, I'm not an electrician, but I'd rather be on an insulated, um, uh, ladder uh, than to be up there possibly uh, touching live wires. Um, top of the line, it's not cheap one and it's not the cheap uh, fiberglass ones either. There's a couple of versions that are very cheap. You want to get the, the expensive ones that will last you uh, 10, 20 years. They're solid. You want a couple of them. You always want to bring up a couple. You don't want to be sharing ladders with people. So you want to bring up more than one ladder. And even if there's just two people cable and there's nothing wrong bringing up three or four ladders and just space them around, use them whenever you need them. Again, that's the same principle as having your tools right there on your, on your belt so you can just reach and get them. I'm on top of the ladder and I don't have my tools. I need a wire cutter. I've got to get down and get the wire cutter. And then I cut it. Then I need to get down and get the tape, uh, the electrical tape to uh, tie it off and so forth and so on. Um, Again, when you run into firewalls, like this is a firewall and it's between the suite and the walkway, uh, the hallway, and you can tell it's a firewall because the electrician was kind enough to put in a metal box. On those type of things, they usually have a flex conduit. It's a conduit that, that bends back and forth. Um, it's not the rigid conduit, and sometimes it's hard to get through the flex uh, conduit with a uh, fishing rod. So we use nylon uh, fishing. Now, now, if you notice, we're going from the bottom up and then we're going to attach the cable and pull it down. So go ahead. You see where the, at the end you can see the sticking out there? Okay, so now the technician's going to go up, he's going to take his three cables. You know, if you're going to pull to a position, you should at least pull two cables. Go ahead. And and I'm only going to pull so much of it because he's going to leave a little bit of a service loop up there. So tell me when I'm pulled enough. Okay. Now this is, this may appear to be excessive, it is not. This is what you want to pull, you want to pull a little bit out from the wall. And look up there, you can see it's left the service loop up there. It's also kept most of the cable off the ceiling tiles. When you're not ready to jack, what you want to do is you just want to wrap these up like this. Now you want to wrap them up in such a way that someone can't pull them back from the other end. So 
If you put them in like that, you're okay. And it doesn't matter if someone spray paints this or anything else, it's, it's, it has no consequence. Because remember, we did not label these things. There's no labeling on here. There's no marks telling us what cable it is. Because we're going to identify that cable later after we put it in. So that's, that's what it is. There's no identification here. So you can spray paint over it and everything else. I remember a big project that uh, someone did that I recommended they not label. And they did label. And they punched it all down. And they added extra jacks. And before they actually jacked it, they pulled extra cable, I mean. Before they actually jacked it, the guy came in and sprayed all the cables, so it completely confused them. It was a large job and completely confused them what cable was going where. And I kept on emphasizing to them, but they didn't listen, that you don't need to label these things. You just identify them when they, uh, uh, when it's, uh, after you jack them and after you put them in the patch panel. So this one is just a pull string, as you can see with an open plaster ring, sometimes called a P-ring. And you can see the string is right there. And we already pulled the cable to the location. cables don't always have to be in conduit when they're in an office setting like this. So when they're in an office setting, when they're in an office setting, you don't always have to use conduit. Now, if you're in a warehouse, you have to use rigid conduit according to code in your state. But in California, it has to be a rigid conduit. Uh, I take that back. Uh, low, not low voltage, but regular electricity has to be in conduit. But low voltage does not have to be in conduit. So you got to cut some of that out. You ready? Okay. Nice enough electrician. Great electrician on this job, by the way. Did a nice job. This is really a two-man job. One has to push the cable down, or, or line the cable up. Excuse me, not push it down and the other one has to pull down on it. Okay. Is that enough? Sure. How's that? Nice length. You're not punching down right up next to the wall. You actually have some length. You can push it back in there when you're all done. Give you some room to troubleshoot the jack in the future. Or if you have to replace a jack, it gives you extra room. A lot of this will be cut off. We won't even untape this, just cut it off and recycle the copper. Okay, this is your average phone room. And uh, th let's look at some other things. In other videos, I've noticed I told you you put little loops in there. See the little loops? This makes it nice because if you follow this loop, you'll see down here, you'll see it moving. So you got your little loop here. And as you can see, this wire is moving. So that's how you trace these wires. And this is why you put loops in them. Goes across here, goes down here. You grab this, you pull up on it, and you can see that it's going down there. That's a big loop. That's pretty sloppy. Some of these 66 blocks have been abandoned. In fact, all these have been abandoned, which is absolutely fine. Um, here's one 10 blocks. This is a unprofessional mess if they're using it. Uh, phone room is pretty normal when you see all this type of cabling and all this is pretty much what you see uh, in phone rooms. Sometimes you find uh, uh, the sub lunch that subway lunch that someone had last week, or the uh, chocolate bar wrappers or the soda cans in here also. Um, but remember, if you're a professional, keep it neat. Now, of course, these red boxes over here is the phone company boxes. Uh, uh, that they come in and, and they're called RJ21Xs and they are 66 blocks with red covers on them, that's all. And it's how they bring in phone numbers and everything else uh, there. Um, as you can see that orange up here, this orange piping, 
That's called inner duct. It's not conduit, it's called inner duct, and it protects the fiber optic cable that's in it. Um, and by code in California, you got to put fiber optic cable in inner duct. Now, the reason we're in here today is we're going to pull the, the uh, feed cable uh, from uh, the phone room here, uh, where the phone company brings in telephone lines, and we're going to pull it to our um, main distribution frame that we've been dealing with in the videos that you have seen so far. So we're going to use 25 pair cable. Here's a 25 pair cable. And a technician can get in there and start pulling it as I talk about 25 pair cable. Now there's someone on the other side going to grab that cable. Let's talk a little bit about that pipe that he's pushing through right there. And that pipe that's there is a, uh, <coughs> is this a rigid conduit. Do you have it? And it's for a fire break. He's talking to the person on the other side. Yeah, pull some through. So he's feeding the cable along with a uh, Cat 5E cable for your uh, uh, other. Uh, is that what it is? Data circuit yeah, going in there? Okay. 25 pair cable um, is the standard in industry when you need uh, more than just a few pairs, and it's usually used for feed cable of some sort. It's, it's not that expensive. Um, it, what was kind of interesting um, years ago was that uh, I worked for a company, and they kept on asking me to pull uh, four pair cables uh, from one floor to another. And finally, after about the third time, I suggested that since they seem to need um, cables between uh, the third and the first floor all the time, I would recommend that we pull a 25 pair cable from the third floor to the first floor and then explain to them that the labor involved to pull a 25 pair cable is just slightly more than what it takes them to install a uh, single four pair cable. Um, and the 25 pair cable is not that much more expensive um, than a four pair cable. And of course, uh, the lady at that point was very upset that I would offer to over uh, cable her building. <laughs> Sometimes I don't understand. But they went on, and month after month, we kept on pulling more and more four pair cable, uh, what they needed that month. So eventually we had, I don't know, 10 or 24 pair cables going from the third to the fourth floor. Glad we had pull string in there. But the idea is use 25 pair cable, especially for your POTS lines. And uh, they buy them in big reels, 1,000 foot reels like that. Really very inexpensive. Um, uh, very inexpensive to buy uh, compared to regular uh, computer four pair uh, cable. And uh, very practical. So we always keep numerous rolls like this in our office. This is obviously the phone room we were just in. And so both of these walls here are firewalls. As, as you walk down the hallway here, you can see both walls are firewalls, and the ceiling is a firewall also. But it's open from that suite uh, to this suite. We have a pathway, so we're going to go through the two suites uh, through that pathway. But this is a firewall. So if there's a fire, people can escape. They're not caught. You know, it could be fire on both sides. They're not going to have a problem. They can get right out the door. The cable is going to come across over top of the firewall. It's going to come down. And then once it comes down, it's going to come through here, and we're going to fish it back to the IDF. Notice that string? A lot of people wonder what that string is for. Well, it's for uh, slicing the outside uh, covering, the plastic covering. See? Pulls right off now. And uh, it gives you a, uh, a cleaner install when you do it this way. You pull all the way back, as far back as you need. In other words, he's not pulling all the way back to that tie wrap. He's just pulling back as far back as you possibly need. And then cutting off the excess plastic there. And uh, now he's trimming up the cable. But he's keeping the twist on the cable as close as possible to the punch down area. And you want to do that. You don't want to untwist the whole thing as far back as you can. No, just 
just as much as you need. And you can see that right now being punched down. And we're using here uh, a swing gate um, or a standoff bracket. Uh, both names are fine. And uh, the patch panel is attached on one end and he just has it swung out. He's using the wall actually as a stop when he punches down. But it's just untwisting just as much as he needs and then pushing it down. It's following the color code that's right there on the patch panel. Now he's going to punch down. So some people have asked the question, well if I'm using Cat 5e cable and I'm using Cat 6 jacks, uh, does that make it a uh, Cat 6 installation? And the answer is no, it makes it a Cat 5e. So when any one component within the system um, is lower than the other components, uh, it's considered the, the lower uh, of the ratings. So uh, this is a, a Cat 5e installation and uh, uh, and we have CAT uh, 5E uh, patch panel and we have CAT 5E jacks. So it's CAT 5E from one end to the other. So what we're using here is the cable comb and uh, that's a nice little system that's already on the cable and it straightens out the cables. Now another thing you want to do, especially on computer cables, is, is use Velcro tie wraps here, not regular nylon tie wraps because what happens with them is they tighten the cable down too much and when you do that you can damage the cable where the Velcro won't, it's wider Plus, you can add cables in the future without cutting all the tie wraps and restarting over again. So this cable comb snaps apart. You can see it. You put the cables in there. And then as you pull down, it does what its name tells you. It uh, combs the cable. Jim, why don't you shut that off? Shut what off? On the camera. Okay. Why? Doesn't hurt it, does it? Well, it doesn't hurt. Just <laughs> Well, you might be able to use it as backup or something. So just giving it eye distance, every six to eight inches, 12 inches maybe. Notice he has a lot of extra cable there, which looks like it's a lot of extra cable on the ground. And this is necessary. It's not a waste. Most expensive cable on earth is the one that's one inch too short. And it makes it easier when you have lengths like this to do cable management. We use these uh, cable combs all the time. It really does a really nice job. Now the Velcro. If I'm in rolls, you cut off what you need. That's the most convenient way. Sometimes you can cut a bunch ahead of time before you start a job. You can always reposition the Velcro later. And cabling neatness counts. We use fishing rods, go right up the wall very easily. Be careful. And then you attach the cable. So what's interesting here, um, 
is that we're doing two RJ11s and using one cable. So uh, the blue pair is the first jack on the left, upper left, and the uh, orange pair. Yep, got that backwards, huh? Yep, I sure do. Uh, upper, uh, the orange pair is the second one, and that's going to be in the upper right. It's okay, these things snap out and snap right back in. You don't cut off the other calyx, leave it there like that, wind it around itself, and that allows you the ability in the future to add another jack without cutting the cable. Now, doing the data jack. Okay, what we're looking at here is we, we put in two jacks here because there was more jacks than one faceplate would handle. A faceplate can handle up to six. They needed eight here. Um, Face plate up. Face plate up to six jacks right here uh, in one face plate, but that's the max. They needed eight, so we put two face plates here. But the thing we did is we had to cut this face pa face plate in, and there's videos on that how to uh, cut it in. So we had to cut a hole here, and you can see the thing where it came out of the hole there. And but he's protecting the carpet with this piece of plastic here. Sometimes you can just take a piece of paper from the trash and you can put it here and use that. And then when you're done, all you need to do is just pick it up like this and then all your scrap goes with you. Customer would really like that. See how clean that is now? Even though there's a lot of dump, uh, trash in here, it's now preserved in the bag or the paper and uh, the face plate's on the wall. Nice and neat. Okay, this is a great device. This is really going to save you time. and. Uh, these are little LEDs that we're putting into the patch panel. Obviously, the patch panel is completed in its cabling. And uh, these little LEDs will light up when I, when I plug in the power supply into a jack. And you'll see it here shortly. And uh, this just saves tons of time here. And, uh, and our power supply is plug it right into the jack. And whammo, there it is, cable 14. We did not mark the cables. Think of that time we saved. Uh, we didn't mark the cables. Uh, does it really matter if they're in order? No, it doesn't really matter. It just matters that when someone walks up to this jack, it says 14 here, and they can go right back to the patch panel and plug in their patch cords where it says 14. So that gives them the world of answers. You don't need to put them in order. I hate that when people think that's a really an intelligent way to do it, I'm right on the cable and put them out there. There are exceptions to that, and that's when you're not using a patch panel, maybe you're running two or three cameras or something up in the ceiling, you know, things like that. I still don't think you should, you should label them, but the standard should be just plugging in the power supply, which lights the LED. And David, you can go do the next one. And as David goes to the next one, let's look at the patch panel and watch it light up. He's just writing them down on the floor plan now. Seven! He's going to go back and label each one. 13. You cannot tone and probe out the jacks that fast. No matter how good you are, you can't do it. 9. See, it's nice now. You know how many have left the test. 
So you're not retesting these. If you're a tonin probe, you have to go all through these again. Be here forever. So this is not meant to test beyond the fact that is the cable actually attached. Hey, thank you for watching the video. Really appreciate it. Um, watch some of our other videos. Check them out. Uh, they have a lot of great technical information for you and everything else. And, and please, you know what helps me uh, afford these type of videos uh, is uh, when people buy from my website. So if you need any of this equipment, if you purchase it from the website, I can produce more technical videos. This is Jim Gibson with CableSupply.com, and hey, thanks for watching. Hi, this is Jim with CableSupply.com. Hi, this is Jim from CableSupply.com. Hi, this is Jim with CableSupply.com, and today I'm going to show you how to cut a hole in the drywall. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to this YouTube installment of CableSupply.com.